have. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, world's largest organization of residential commercial property inspectors. We essentially train and certify home inspectors all over the world. And we also have training partners. And um, what we do is we invite them to our InterNACHI webinar to share information so that we can stay successful in our businesses. And one of the things that um, I always love talking about is infrared. I think every home inspector should get into infrared. Um, don't just buy an infrared camera and start whipping it around and start talking. You need training and certification and experience and uh, a few other things. And so that's why we partner up with experts like Jim Seffron from Infraspection Institute. And that's at infraspection.com if you wanna contact Jim. Jim's gonna to talk to us today about a really important topic and probably a really great opportunity, now that I was thinking about it with Jim just a brief moment ago, about an opportunity for inspectors to help institutions, organizations, such as schools, private schools, public schools, uh, sports teams, to check on the health uh, of their um, people uh, in their organizations. So uh, we're using infrared. But again, you just can't grab an infrared and start pointing around at people or walls or ceilings or, or components of a home without knowing how to do it properly by a standard. And that's what Infraspection Institute is all about, the standards by which you operate and perform an inspection using infrared thermal technology. Jim, are you with us? I am here. Good Jim, morning. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to share a little bit about this important topic about infrared body temperature screening. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Ben, and thank you all to the members uh, who are joining us uh, this morning. Um, ben had uh, contacted me early on uh, in the earliest days of the uh, current pandemic asking about utilizing thermal imagers for uh, detecting a symptom of COVID-19. And I respond at the time, it's a rather rich topic and it's not one that is easily answered in a word or two. It's, it's fairly rich. Uh, and there are certain things that you need to keep in mind when you engage in this type of um, usage of your infrared imager. Many of the members uh, have infrared imagers and we're going to talk about how they can potentially seek out a new revenue stream uh, while helping to protect the health and welfare of the public at large. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, information which is current. It applies not only here to the United States, but also internationally. Uh, we're in some very interesting times and we're going to talk about how regulations have been relaxed here in the US, but not so internationally. So what I want to share with you are excerpts from a, one of our training courses, uh, and that is our infrared body temperature screening course. So today what I've put together for the members is a presentation which is geared specifically toward home and building inspectors who may wish to find a new use or an additional use of their thermal imaging systems. Fa so fantastic, Jim. I, I just wanted to interrupt you sure. before you start um, uh, teaching us about the infrared temperature screening. If you're attending the live webinar, feel free to ask questions. Um, during Jim's presentation, we can take them on the fly or at the end. Uh, so if you're attending right now, there's a, a little Q&A button or a chat button. I'll be monitoring that for Jim and I'll interrupt him if we need to or just save all the questions till, till the end. But feel free to ask questions. Thanks, Jim, sorry about that. Thank you, no, no, brilliant, thank you. Okay, so without any further ado, we'll, we'll get started. Okay, infrared thermography is a technology frequently used by home and building inspectors. Bear with me, I wanna just make sure I've got my... Okay, there we go. Since elevated body temperature is a symptom of COVID-19, it's possible to use a thermal imager to detect febrile or feverish persons provided that their imager meets certain specifications and appropriate protocols or procedures are followed. 
COVID-19 pandemic that we are currently experiencing has created worldwide interest in the use of thermal imaging as a screening tool for detecting febrile persons. So in this presentation, we're going to focus on infrared body temperature screening and how owners of infrared cameras or imagers may find a new use for their equipment in helping to fight the spread of COVID-19. Before I get too deep, for those who may not be experienced in thermal imaging, I just want to go over a few definitions that will be key and will be utilized throughout our presentation this morning. First up is qualitative thermography. Qualitative thermography or thermal imaging is the art and science of detecting, displaying, and recording thermal patterns across the surface of an object. Second definition is quantitative thermography. This is the art and science of detecting, displaying, and recording thermal patterns and temperatures across the surface of an object. Elevated body temperature screening is a form of quantitative thermography. We're not only looking at thermal patterns, but more importantly, we're looking at temperatures derived with infrared equipment. And of course, a thermographer is a person who performs infrared inspections or operates a thermal imager. Last definition, is infrared body temperature screening, also known in some circles as elevated skin temperature screening. This is the use of an infrared imaging system to determine the apparent surface temperature of a human being. A few definitions pertaining to equipment. First up is a thermal imager. A thermal imager is a video camera-like device capable of detecting, displaying, and recording thermal patterns across the surface of an object. Second definition is a radiometer. A radiometer is an instrument which has become quite common in many areas. Uh, in fact, they've become quite affordable and they are found in nearly every facility. A radiometer, also known as an infrared thermometer or a non-contact thermometer, is an electronic device that converts infrared energy emitted by an object surface into a temperature value. Pictured here, we see a medical grade thermometer, and we're going to talk about the importance of the differences between industrial grade thermometers and medical grade thermometers as we have all through our slides this morning. Last definition is an imaging radiometer. This is a thermal imager capable of measuring temperatures. Many of the infrared imagers that are sold to home and building inspectors these days are of the imaging radiometer type. They are thermal imagers that are capable of measuring temperature. I noticed, Ben, behind you, uh, or superimposed, you have a FLIR C, probably a C, C3. Yep. <laughs> a FLIR C3, which is, which is also an imaging radiometer. Pictured here with this slide, we see several typical modern thermal imagers. Uh, pictured on the right-hand side are two instruments uh, produced by FLIR Systems Incorporated. In the upper left, we have one by Infrared Cameras Incorporated, Center Fotric Instruments, and down in the lower left, a Seek Thermal Infrared Imager. Now, the two on the right are typical of what home and building inspectors might have or something similar to them. These instruments were originally designed for uh, industrial and commercial applications or for home inspectors that are inspecting um, residences or multifamily buildings or even commercial buildings. The three that appear uh, from center to the left are medical grade instruments and they are purpose built for elevated skin temperature screening. Those who have a thermal imager uh, will note that thermal imagers are extremely sensitive to small temperature differentials or delta T's. Thermal imagers can detect delta T's as small as one-tenth of a Celsius degree, or just a fraction of a Fahrenheit degree. You see here a pair of images where a person has placed their hand on a wall surface for a few seconds and then removed it. And using a thermal imager, we can see the thermal handprint that is left behind. That handprint, uh, whether it be on a table or on a wall, can be detectable for up to several minutes after the hand has been removed. Here we see some, a, an example of several typical point radiometers or infrared thermometers. The three at the top are industrial grade. They are meant for use for building or machinery inspections, while the three at the bottom are medical grade instruments. The one at the left is a contact infrared. Keep in mind, not all infrared instruments are designed to be non-contact. However, the two at the center and right on the bottom, they are medical grade. They are non-contact. 
So the two, three at the top are industrial grade. They are not sensitive enough nor accurate, sorry, they're not accurate enough in order to produce acceptable results or to be used for human body temperature measurement, while the three at the bottom are. We'll talk more about that as we get into our slides a little deeper. So let's talk about infrared body temperature screening. Infrared body temperature screening is the use of an imaging radiometer to detect potentially febrile humans. Now, febrile means feverish. A person has a fever. It's also known as elevated body temperature screening. Some people use the uh, abbreviation EBT. Others have adopted uh, the term elevated skin temperature or EST screening. But no matter what you call it, infrared body temperature screening is the use of an imaging radiometer to detect potentially febrile humans. It must be understood from the outset that data from an imaging radiometer alone are not conclusive. Therefore, observed temperatures must be confirmed by independent means in order to meet the protocol set forth by the FDA and the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. In order to perform infrared body temperature screening properly, individuals are screened singly under controlled conditions. Now, if you've been watching television during the pandemic, there's been a lot of attention given to different types of um, infrared equipment that will screen groups of people or you stand in front of something it looks at your face i've seen one recently you pass your wrist through it none of these meet the standards that have been in place for many years these standards are not new they've been in place for a very long time and they are what is acceptable to the uh, world population um, for a number of reasons which are uh, too numerous to go into right now there's a lot of equipment out there that's not being used properly and a lot of equipment which just is not effective. So in order to do this properly, that is using a thermal imager for elevated body temperature screening, persons are screened singly under controlled conditions. Anyone who is exhibiting a temperature above a predetermined alarm level is then asked to have their body temperature confirmed independently utilizing a clinical grade thermometer. That thermometer can either be a contact thermometer or because of the uh, challenges associated with sanitation, a non-contact or infrared thermometer is typically used. We'll talk about both of those techniques in just a little bit. Now applications for infrared body temperature screening are many. Any place where a person can be, or persons can be screened for detecting potentially febrile persons prior to entering a facility or area is a place where we can apply thermal imaging. Examples would include, but not be limited to, theaters, stadiums, arenas, bars, restaurants, and entertainment venues, courthouses, government buildings, schools, and universities, hospitals, skilled nursing or rehabilitation centers, and healthcare facilities. Other locations where infrared body temperature screening can be applied is at security checkpoints, such as airports, transportation terminals, or stations manufacturing facilities, warehouses, and distribution centers, and also office buildings, retail stores, shopping malls, and construction sites. Jim, do you think this could be applied for home inspection companies with more than one home inspector? Can I screen my own staff? Absolutely. Uh, you could do that. Um, it's not really limited to a number of people, uh, a minimum or maximum, as long as the protocols are followed. Good question. Now, there are several ways to perform infrared body temperature screening. And if you've been out in my home state of New Jersey or others who are applying similar protocols, um, you may have been asked to have your temperature taken by a security person or a medical person at the door. I had a doctor's checkup uh, earlier this week. And before I, just as soon as I got through the door, I got uh, asked to stop at the, uh, at, at the front desk and have my temperature taken. Uh, earlier this month, I went for a haircut. Never thought I'd miss that in the way I did. I, four months, <laughs> got one in February and I didn't get another until June. It was a long time and I was, uh, I was looking like I needed one terribly, but even my hairdresser has an infrared thermometer, or I should say 
hair care professional. They, they don't like to be called that anymore. <laughs> so I had my temperature taken at the uh, family hair care uh, salon prior to getting my hair cut. So one of the ways to perform infrared body temperature screening is utilizing a clinical grade infrared thermometer. These can be either contact or non-contact. Although most people are going to opt for the contact because uh, if you're using a contact, that would be something you stick under a person's tongue or in their ear. You've got sanitation, you have uh, sanitization issues. You've got to clean it and sanitize it between each use. So most are opting for the non-contact device. Now, if you elect to go with a clinical grade thermometer, it can be a little more time consuming. Um, you're going to be in close proximity to anybody you are testing and you could have sanitation issues or challenges. A second way to perform infrared body temperature screening is to utilize a purpose-built imaging radiometer. These are typically fixed mount, non-portable systems intended for human temperature screening. They're purpose-built instruments. A third way, and this is where home inspectors come into play, you can use a commercial grade imaging radiometer. These are typically portable handheld systems intended initially for commercial and industrial use. Provided they meet certain protocols, they can be used for elevated body temperature screening. Now, prior to April of this year, the United States Food and Drug Administration required that any instrument that was going to be used for human temperature measurement or diagnosis had to have a 510K clearance. With respect to thermal imaging systems, when you are using them to ascertain a person's body temperature, regardless of what they were built for, they are now being used for medical application. And prior to April this year, the US FDA required you had to have a 510K clearance for this equipment. Now that 510K clearance is not something that is um, widely applied or available on industrial imaging systems. Now in order to help satisfy a need for rapid body temperature measurement, the US FDA waived the 510K requirement for the duration of the pandemic that we are currently engaged in. They waived this requirement provided that the equipment meets certain minimum specifications. And we'll talk about those on the upcoming slides. So who should perform infrared body temperature screening? I wanna point out very quickly that Infrared body temperature screening is not a point and shoot technology. You don't just pick up an image or turn it on and start taking temperatures with it. You have to understand what you're doing. Fortunately, it's not that hard to learn what is required to do this properly. With respect to body temperature screening, the accuracy of the data that are collected are largely influenced by the equipment operator and his or her knowledge and skill sets. Under the standard published by the International Organization for Standardization that goes by the abbreviation ISO, ISO's uh, technical report 13154 colon 2017, and I wanna point this out to, the, to those watching today. Note the date on the screen, 2017. This is not a new document. It's been around as of this year for three years and it was predated by others that date back to the early 2000s. So under medical electrical equipment, deployment, implementation, and operational guidelines for identifying febrile humans using a screening thermograph. This is where we find a lot of the protocols that were set up subsequent to the SARS outbreak that occurred back in 2003. ISO TR 13154 states that operators should be trained to recognize proper alignment and position of a person, to be able to operate the thermal imaging system, and be familiar with workflow, safety issues, and protocols for testing. Also to respond appropriately when an individual is suspected of being febrile. Now you may wonder why we're talking about ISO TR13154 for those inspectors and those persons here in the United States. The reason is the US FDA has taken this standard, originally published by ISO, and refers to it quite extensively in their documentation and requirements. So we have to understand what is in this. Fortunately for everybody today, I've distilled this into a simplest elements and tried to make it uh, digestible for the members this morning. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the uh, thermal imaging was first used during the SARS outbreak of 2003. 
Now the results varied um, amongst uses of thermal imaging equipment at the time due to lack of standards for equipment usage, uh, for infrared equipment itself and its usage. Uh, during the SARS outbreak, in instrumentation was deployed at several locations throughout Europe and also Canada, among other places. And the results were varied. There was not a very high, um, very high success rate in capturing those who were carriers of SARS at the time. Responding to this in the ensuing years, ISO came up with a set of protocols which exist to this day. So this, these challenges led to the publication of ISO Technical Report 13154, which offered guidelines for the implementation and operation of an infrared screening system. Now, the current COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in unprecedented interest in thermal imaging as a potential screening tool for detecting febrile persons. However, it's again not a point and shoot technology. Best practices are required to ensure accuracy. The benefit to infrared body temperature screening is it provides a rapid means for temperature checks. It also allows this to be done at a safe distance where you're not at arm's length from another person. One of the um, components in the Opening Up America Again document that was published uh, back in April by the U.S. government, uh, part of the employer guidelines in Opening Up America Again state that temperature checks should be performed for employees. So it's one of six of the bullet points that are covered specifically. Now there are limitations to infrared body temperature screening. I'd like to spend just a little bit of time talking about those. When we speak about human body core temperature, that is our internal temperature, it is approximately 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Now, human body core temperature can vary between persons uh, depending upon their age, the time of day, physical activity, gender, food, or drink that has been recently consumed. Human, humans are considered to be febrile or feverish when their body temperature reaches 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. Now, I'm an American. I still work in Fahrenheit, but I frequently work in Celsius. And for those of you who do work in Celsius as a preference, this is where the Celsius system has it down pat. It's 37C or less is normal. 38 and up is a fever. We don't have to worry about decimal places. But if you do the math between the two, it is one Celsius degree or 1.8 Fahrenheit degrees of difference from 98.6 makes a person febrile. So with body temperature screening, we are seeking to detect febrile persons. As we all know that if a elevated body temperature or fever is one of the symptoms of COVID-19. One of the challenges or limitations of infrared body temperature screening is that infected persons, that is carriers of the coronavirus, may not be febrile at the time of screening. And if this is the case, that's a person you're not going to catch through any means of body temperature screening, whether it's with a thermal imager or even a contact thermometer. So afebrile infected persons cannot be detected by IR body temperature screening. One should also be aware that thermal imagers are capable of both false positives and false negatives. So in this brief course today, it's intended to minimize the likelihood of errors associated with both human operators and the equipment that they utilize. When a person tests positive or sets off an alarm with our infrared body temperature screening uh, imager, these positive uh, persons testing positive require independent confirmation. It also must be understood it's impossible to determine the cause of a fever. If a person passes through a screening checkpoint and is found to be febrile and that's confirmed, we don't know why. They could have, they could have an infection, they could be suffering from the common flu, or they could be uh, carriers of COVID-19. We simply don't know. There is a limitation to this equipment, and again, we're looking to detect persons who are febrile. It also needs to be understood that observed body temperatures are specific to the time of testing. This doesn't ensure, the use of a thermal imaging system this morning doesn't ensure that somebody won't develop a fever in the afternoon or tomorrow or a couple of days from now. So they are uh, observations specific to a point in time. 
Also must be understood that negative results do not ensure the absence of infection and they are not a guarantee of future health. They just mean that that person is not exhibiting an elevated body temperature at that point in time. I want to talk just a little bit about the need for secondary verification. Infrared is not a standalone tool when it comes to elevated body temperature screening. As part of a human body temperature screening system, we're going to have not only our imaging radiometer, or if you prefer, our infrared camera, but we also must have a clinical grade thermometer as part of that screening system. The infrared radiometer or imaging radiometer or infrared camera is a screening tool. It generates pass-fail results. So it is pass-fail testing that identifies potentially febrile persons. Be aware that infrared imaging equipment is subject to measurement errors due to differences in screen persons, operator error, or within the imaging system itself. When you have someone that indicates a positive result with the thermal imager, we then use a secondary tool. In this case, pictured here, we see a medical grade infrared thermometer to confirm the presence of a fever. We can also use this if we are operating a screening checkpoint at the entrance to a school or facility. We can also use that thermometer for periodic confirmation that the imager is working properly. So if persons are passing through and you're getting a reading of 98, 97, 97.5, and your independent uh, confirming thermometer, in this case, the um, infrared radiometer, uh, is confirming those numbers, then you have agreement and it confirms that you're doing things properly. When it comes to this application, one must consider safety issues and health issues. Infrared body temperature screening involves close contact with others. Now, you're going to, as a thermal imager operator, you can operate remotely, but somebody, whether it is the infrared equipment operator or a second person, if you have a large group of people that's being screened in a steady, with a steady flow of people, they're going to be basically at arm's length when they use an infrared thermometer to confirm um, the body temperature of those testing positive. So persons must utilize appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE. This would include uh, masks, wear appropriate face shields, gloves, and the use of hand sanitizer as appropriate. You also want to practice physical distancing to the extent possible. And implement steps for sanitizing the screened area, the screening area, and the equipment that is utilized. Now we want to talk about thermal imaging systems. Pictured here on the right-hand side of the screen, we see a fixed mount dedicated infrared imaging system used as part of a, a security checkpoint, an entry point at a, at a location. And at the lower right, we see a, a typical uh, industrial grade thermal imaging system. So with respect to where we stand presently with the COVID-19 pandemic here in the United States, Body screening thermal imagers may be either of the purpose-built type pictured at the upper right or industrial grade handheld man portable instruments like the one pictured at lower right. Typically, your thermal imager is going to have a component inside known as the detector. Focal plane array detector is dependent, uh, depends upon for cooled system, they're going to be short wave. Uncooled systems are going to be a long wave spectral response. For the majority of members here at InterNACHI, if you bought an instrument in the last, uh, say, five or six years and you spent $10,000 or less, uh, it's likely that you have an uncooled system. It's going to be an instant on. It'll be long wave. These instruments are less costly. They offer faster startup and they're readily available. If you have a cooled system, chances are it's going to be far more expensive, uh, oftentimes exceeding several tens of thousands of dollars for those instruments. But either one, no matter what you have, is acceptable. At present, uncooled systems constitute nearly 100% of portable imagers available commercially. You also need to select a thermal imager with sufficient image quality and measurement accuracy. This is determined by the detector inside the instrument and the optics attached and also proper imager use. When it comes to selecting a thermal imager, the United States Food and Drug Administration has strict requirements for medical equipment. Prior to the 2019 pandemic, sorry, that should say 20, uh, well, it's 
we're calling it 2019 because it started in 2019, but it's the one we're currently engaged in. So prior to the current pandemic, imagers were required to have a 510K clearance. I had mentioned this before. This was intended to ensure that the device was suitable for its intended use. In order to obtain a 510K clearance, the manufacturer had to comply with rules for the marketing of the device in the future, as well as making sure that it was suitable for its intended use at the outset. For those of, the, of you that own FLIR systems, thermal imaging systems, uh, you may find, if you check with FLIR, that the instrument you currently have may likely have a 510K clearance already. So prior to purchasing a system, ascertain if the imager has a 510K clearance. Now, in April 2020, just a few months ago, the FDA relaxed this 510K requirement, allowing for imager alternatives. So prior to April, you had to have a 510K clearance. At present, that has been waived. If you have a 510K clearance for your equipment, you can still use it. But if you don't have one presently, it's not a deal breaker for using your instrument for elevated body temperature screening. Now, for those of you who have an instrument that is not 510K cleared, as I said a moment ago, it's possible to use it at present. However, you need to understand that the FDA has stated in their publications that they intend to return to a 510K requirement in the future. So before you invest a lot of money into non-510K cleared systems, know that if this is your sole purpose in making your investment, if the FDA returns to the 510K requirement, it could disallow future use of non-510K cleared systems. Now, for those of you working internationally, you should be aware that ISO 13154 and a document which is incorporated by reference, which is IEC 80601, have not been relaxed due to the current pandemic. So how do we select the thermal imager? Well, if we look to FDA guidance for body temperature screening, for body temperature screening, the US FDA guidance of April 2020 states that during the pandemic, you may use a 510K cleared imager. You may also use as an alternative, a non 510K cleared imager, provided that it complies with IEC 80601, or it's tested using alternative performance specifications that would produce similar results to that document. Such testing could include an uncertainty of within 0.5 Celsius or less between 34 and 39 C. That would be um, roughly 0.9 Fahrenheit. Uh, a black body reference source and the stability and drift must be less than 0 0.2, uh, 0.2 Celsius or 0.36 Fahrenheit. Now, if you do engage in this, the, this is not something that you just set it up in a parking lot or at an outdoor stadium and start taking temperatures in any weather conditions or at any time of the year. In order to have a properly um, and effective screening area set up, this area should be clean and it should be a dry indoor location with adequate lighting. The air temperature should be between 68 to 80 Fahrenheit and the humidity 50% or less. The screening area setup uh, should be designed for persons to form a single file line maintaining six feet of clearance. When you have large groups of people, you may elect to have a switchback configuration if you have tight quarters, making certain, however, that you maintain that six feet of clearance between persons. The screening area setup should, um, should also be free of intense uh, heat sources, hot or cold drafts, and uh, high volume cooling fans. Also, in your area that's uh, your screening area, appropriate signage should be posted with company policies and instructions as to what is expected of those about to undergo screening. Your imaging station, wherever it's located inside of your screening area, should be located away from doors, windows, and uninsulated walls. If glass or plastic screens are used, they must not block the imager's field of view. For those of you familiar with thermal imager use, you know from experience that an image will not see through glass or plastics of nominal thickness. Nominal thickness. 
Now, during screening, persons are screened singly at a distance recommended by the manufacturer. Depending upon the instrument that is chosen, this will be a distance of typically four and a half feet up to 10 feet. This is going to depend upon the instrument and its optics. The imager lens should be perpendicular to the subject's face, and only subject persons should appear within the imager's field of view during imaging. There should also be, as part of your screening area, a private area for temperature verification. It should be located adjacent to the imaging area and should not interrupt normal traffic flow. This area should be equipped with a clinical grade contact or infrared thermometer and a means for disinfecting those instruments between uses. Screening area personnel should consist of, ideally for high volume areas, a thermographer who's going to operate the equipment and a separate medical technician who can perform the secondary verification and also relief personnel as appropriate. If you are inspecting a security checkpoint, this is not something that you can do for eight hours straight without a bathroom break, lunch break, or just a brain break because you do get fatigued when you are staring at this monitor screen and making a pass or fail determination every six seconds. Pictured here we see a diagram of a typical screening area layout. You can see at the upper left, this is the point of entry, switchback configuration for people to um, uh, move through until they get to the screening area, the imaging station. Uh, from here, they get their image taken along with their temperature. If they are uh, not considered febrile, they're below 100.4, they can then proceed to the facility. If they set off an alarm, that is, they appear to be above 100.4, then they go to the secondary screening area. If they pass the, their um, secondary screening, they can then enter the facility, and if not, they're asked to leave per facility policy. It's not recommended that you allow febrile persons into the workplace or place of business. If you're going to utilize an industrial portable imager, typical like you, uh, typical of those owned by many home and building inspectors, you want to locate the imager desired distance from the imaging location. Many imagers have a field of view. This is how wide an area that you see of approximately 25 degrees. For a 25 degree field of view, the imager should be approximately six feet from the image person. And tripod use is recommended just to cut down on operator fatigue. Also be certain to choose a sturdy unit with a fluid function head. Make certain that the selected lens is matched to the imager chassis for imager uh, temperature measurement accuracy. And determine, if possible, if the imager can be remotely operated. If not, choose a comfortable position for the operator to watch the imager and be certain to allow for adequate social distancing. A myth I would like to dispel at, the, at this point is that this is not a, um, a technique where we set up an imager and walk away. You have to have an operator watching this. Uh, unfortunately, what we've seen in the media and people not following protocols, there's more wrong ways to set up and to um, operate an imager than there are correct ways. I'm not here to pontificate or stand here hand on, hands on hips, but it's my job to go out, digest the information, tell you what the protocols are. And the protocols are one person at a time, standing still, being imaged, and the imaging system must be monitored. We'd also recommend if you're using an industrial grade portable imager, you disable the following features, a laser pointer, daylight camera flash, and auto image recording. You don't need any of these things to be turned on. This is a screening tool. When you set up your industrial grade or portable imager, you're gonna set your imager inputs for atmospheric correction, such as air temperature, humidity, and distance. You'll set your imager input for lens transmission to 100%. You then select an appropriate imager measurement feature such as crosshair, isotherm, or if you're so equipped, max temperature. You connect your cables and power supplies as necessary and secure all cables, tripods, and power supplies to avoid tripping hazards in the screening area. Next thing you wanna do, whether you, regardless of your imager type, you're gonna power up your imager. If your imager is supplied with one, you power up your black body reference source and the imager. Make certain that you allow sufficient time for the black body and the imager to stabilize. Depending upon your instrument, this could take as much as 30 minutes. So one of the things that we counsel people on who 
are undergoing our training for infrared body temperature screening is this is not something you show up at five minutes before eight or five minutes before opening time with your imager under your arm. If the opening time is eight o'clock, you need to be there half an hour early in order to set up and get everything uh, operational and stabilized. Next, you wanna remove the imager lens cap, making sure that the lens is clean and unobstructed. You select your desired color palette. You can work in monochrome, multicolor, or you can work in monochrome with a high contrast alarm or isotherm. Any of these are acceptable. It's a matter of personal preference. You then adjust your imager focus for clear image. We teach in all of our courses when you're measuring temperature and you're seeking to measure temperature accurately, you must have clear focus. Next, you wanna set your imager's emittance control to 0.98. Human skin, it has a very high emittance and it's generally agreed uh, worldwide that it's around 0.98. So you set your images E control to 0.98. You can then select auto image or manual image mode. When you're using manual mode, set your temperature range to the lowest possible uh, that will cover human temperature measurement. It's typically gonna be range one or the lowest temperature range. You adjust your level and gain controls or level and span if you prefer to optimize the thermal image and continue to adjust as necessary during the day as you are conducting your screening. Be aware that focal plane array imagers or the uncooled imaging systems, which are common for commercial and industrial grade instruments, have a function known as non-uniformity correction. If you uh, look at your screen every once in a while as you're operating your imager, it's likely that the screen will freeze and you may see the word calibrating uh, appear on the screen. This is an image reset feature found on all focal plane array imagers. It operates uh, for most instruments automatically, some are manual, but be aware that there's going to be times when your imager is going to perform this nuke or calibration. And during that time when it's happening for the few seconds it takes, imaging is not possible. So you may have a person step up, your imager goes to nuke, you're gonna to have to ask them to stand there for a couple of seconds longer until the imager finishes nuking or performing that non-uniformity correction function. Next up, as you're setting up, you wanna establish a baseline temperature. Once your system your imaging system is stabilized, you wanna select 10 people who do not have a fever to establish an average baseline temperature. Persons are screened singly with the imager aimed at their face. The imager should be aimed to measure perpendicular to the inner corners of the eye. Purpose-built imagers may do this automatically. Now it is normal for your imager to report temperature values in this area of the face. That is the, it's called the inner canthus for one or inner canthi for two. These inner corners of your eye are going to give you a temperature that is very close to body core temperature. However, it's not uncommon for that temperature to be slightly below the anticipated 98.6 or 37 degrees Celsius. You image the selected 10 persons in succession and you average the readings to establish a normal baseline. Now, some imaging systems will do this automatically. Uh, it really depends upon which one you're operating. Once you've established your, your baseline temperature value, you then set your imager alarm value. The suggested value is one Celsius degree or 1.8 Fahrenheit degrees above your baseline. That alarm may be isotherm, it could be a, a color or an audible tone. Any of these are acceptable. Now the process that we've just gone through must be completed each time the imager is started up. Also, it should be gone through, you should run through the setup process, uh, getting your 10 baseline people. Uh, if you find that ambient temperatures are changing throughout the day or during a work shift. If so, it may require that a baseline uh, temperature be reestablished. You should never use values that you've input or calculated from previous days or work shifts. So this is specific to each time the imager is set up. Fortunately, it doesn't take that long. It takes about a minute to run 10 people through and develop an average baseline and then set your alarm temperature. When it comes to ensuring imager performance, imager readings should be cross verified with a clinical grade thermometer prior to commencing the screening of entrance or at regular intervals thereafter. If disagreement is found, you need to find out the cause for this and discontinue your screening until any problems that you found are corrected. Here we can see a purpose-built imager. 
It's uh, got a box. This person is reading, if you can see it on your screen, 99.2. And this particular instrument gives a green light. It makes it really simple. It's designed to help eliminate operator fatigue. Once you've validated proper image and performance, you then commence imaging of your subject persons. Prior to imaging, persons undergoing imaging should be properly prepared. They should remove their hat, eyeglasses, face masks, and or any face shield. This is just temporary, but the image won't see through eyeglasses, so they need to remove everything so we have a clear view of their face. They should also wipe any excessive perspiration or water from their face. If they're coming in from outdoors and it's been snowing and the snow is melting on their face or they are come in from the rain, you've got to have a dry face in order to do this properly. When outdoor weather is extreme, you may have to allow some time for body temperature to acclimate, whether it be very hot outside or very cold outside. During imaging, persons undergoing imaging should stand directly in front of the imager at the designated location, not have any hot or cold items near their face, so no coffee mugs up near the face or water bottles. They should also look directly at the imager lens and stand still while they are being imaged. Fortunately, it only takes a second or two once they step up to the imaging spot, so it's not going to take a lot of time if they're properly prepared. And this is where signage helps out in the screening area because you don't want people coming in. You have to have a conversation with each person. Please take off your hat. Please take off your eyeglasses. It really slows things down. If you have to tell everybody that as they step up, it, it probably doubles the inspection time. So it could be a lot simpler if a moment or two before they hit the screening mat or the mark on the floor where they just stand, that they're ready, mask off, hat off, eyeglasses off for just a second or two. Despite what you've seen on TV and the internet, with imaging systems, imaging dozens of people or groups of people at one at, at a time, this is not permitted under the standards. It's bad technique, and it can lead to uh, oversight of persons who are potentially febrile. So persons should not be imaged in groups, whether or not the imager manufacturer says their imager is capable. Upon an alarm, you have the person move to a secondary screening area. Pictured here, we see a person who has alarmed this uh, particular image of the Seek thermal. Uh, shows a red box as opposed to a green box. You also get an X. This is a person who's gone above the preset threshold. This person needs to step aside and have his, in this case, his, or it could be a her, um, body temperature checked using a contact or non-contact clinical grade thermometer. That's what's going on in the lower uh, picture at the lower right. Persons not triggering an alarm should be directed to proceed and enter the facility. With proper setup and operation, this is a question I get a lot. What's your expected alarm rate? Your expected alarm rate should be about 5% or less. If you're going above 5%, you either have a very high population of people indicating febrile. Now, I'm not saying it can't happen. Uh, there are places where COVID-19 is running rampant. Uh, so you could have a higher, but the expected alarm rate would be around 5%. Should you have a high number of false positives, check your imager and your inspection techniques, and you may find that you may need to adjust your alarm level. When it comes to measurement accuracy, clear focus is imperative for accurate temperature measurement because improper focus will introduce an error that cannot be compensated for. Make certain that your imager is always correctly focused and stays correctly focused during operation, and all subjects, once your imager is focused, should be screened from the same exact distance. We recommend a floor mat or a mark on the floor for where they should be standing during the uh, measurement process. Keep in mind that imagers do not measure body core temperature. They measure skin surface only. Body core temperature measurement requires a medical grade thermometer. That would be uh, of the oral or sublingual type or an ear thermometer. Imagers also, this is a function of the technology, they cannot accurately measure moving targets, so therefore subjects and the image should remain still during imaging. Another pet peeve of mine as a professional in this business is when we see news broadcasts, and one of the ones that makes me a little wild is when you see these imagers set up in an airport and people are walking by one after another, and this is supposed to be a screening checkpoint, or they don't stand still when they get to the measurement area. These are things that introduce error, and the error that's introduced is usually a false negative. So you miss people, and that's a problem. I say that false positives are inconveniences, false negatives are missed opportunities, or the uh, it's a situation where we allow potentially febrile persons or infected persons into the workplace where they can 
mingle with others, and that's not a good thing. Be aware that all thermal imagers are subject to measurement uncertainty. These are often referred to as accuracy specifications. A typical value is within, or you can also read that as plus minus two Celsius degrees or 3.6 Fahrenheit degrees. Systems that have integrated black bodies, these are dedicated, very expensive systems ranging anywhere from um, around $8,000 and up, although there are some cheaper than that. Uh, they are typically within 0.3 C degrees. They're designed to be highly stable and accurate. In order to understand more about measurement uncertainty, consult the manufacturer's literature for further information. Also be aware that spot measurement size is a critical measurement spec. It's imperative to not use thermal imagers beyond their specified maximum distance because you will understate temperatures for screened persons, thereby allowing potentially febrile persons to slip on by. If your spot size is too large, temperatures will be understated and incorrect. Again, as I said just a moment ago, understated body temperatures are a problem because they allow febrile persons to go undetected, potentially entering a facility and mingling with others where they could become infected. When it comes to complying with regulations, we're in the home stretch, by the way, when it comes to complying with regulations, the US FDA has strict rules governing infrared imagers used for body imaging. Few imaging systems have a 510K clearance. In April 2020, uh, the FDA published a document called the Enforcement Policy for Telethermographic Systems During the Coronavirus Disease 2019 Public Health Emergency. This document re relaxes previous rules for body temperature screening, thereby allowing us to utilize commercial and industrial instruments under the right circumstances. This is a temporary measurement, temporary measure for the duration of the COVID-19 health emergency. Now, the FDA can return to stricter rules at any time. They could wait until the end of this pandemic when it's over, or they could change their minds tomorrow. We don't know. If they do that, it could preclude non-510K cleared imagers from being used uh, in this application in the future. For countries following ISO 13154, there are no waivers or exemptions. Thermal imaging equipment must comply with the requirements laid out in ISO 13154 and the document that it incorporates by reference the International Electric Commission 80601. Prior to purchasing an imager, make sure you check with appropriate authorities if this is an application that you want to become involved with for the insurance compliance with regulations. Question we get quite often is fever screening in the law. The US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission enforces federal laws for private sector employees, employers, this is the Americans with Disabilities Act. For federal employees, it's the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. The ADA applies to companies with 15 or more employees. Now, in a document known as the Pandemic Preparedness in the Workplace and the ADA, this was originally published in October of 2009. It was revised just this year in March. So one of the things I said at the outset of today's presentation is a lot of these rules are not new. They date back several years. They did not just and they did not just come about in the last few months. So to the question, is fever screening legal? Under the pandemic preparedness in the workplace uh, and the ADA, uh, Section 3 for ADA compliant employer practices for pr pandemic preparedness. Under Section 3B, during a pandemic, this is a direct quote, during a pandemic, may an ADA covered employer take its employees' temperatures to determine whether they have a fever? Answer, generally measuring an employee's body temperature is a medical examination. If pandemic influenza symptoms become more severe than the seasonal flu or the H1N1 virus, such as happened in the spring summer of 2009, or if pandemic influenza becomes widespread in the community as assessed by state or local health authorities or the CDC, then employers may measure employees' body temperature. However, employers should be aware that some people with influenza, including the 2009 H1N1 virus or COVID-19, do not have a fever. Because the CDC and state and local health authorities have acknowledged community spread of COVID-19 and issued attendant precautions as of March 2020, employers may measure employees' body temperature. As with all medical information, the fact that an employee had a fever or other symptoms would be subject to ADA confidentiality requirements. Uh, ben and I both hail from the greater Delaware Valley, the Philadelphia area, and just yesterday we had some, uh, and it continued into this morning, we had a baseball game between the Philadelphia Phillies, our home team, and the Florida Marlins. 
yesterday, four people were confirmed with COVID-19, but the team would not say so for confidentiality reasons. So that was bad enough until this morning, it was found out that eight more players have been diagnosed positive with COVID-19, as well as two coaches, all of whom were in the stadium yesterday. That's led to the cancellation or postponement of tonight's Phillies-Yankees game, where the New York Yankees were supposed to come to town. Uh, as just before we started this presentation, we wasn't even certain that the, how the Marlins were getting home because their flight had been canceled. So this is a big deal as far as, as far as the spread of this disease, and it's happening very rapidly in certain areas. Back to the document. The document further states that during a pandemic, employers should rely on the latest CDC and state or local public health assessments. While the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission recognized that public health recommendations may change during a crisis and differ between states, employers are expected to make their best efforts to obtain public health advice that is contemporaneous and appropriate for their location and to make reasonable assessments of conditions in their workplace based on this information. The bottom line is if you engage in body temperature screening and you offer your services for hire to your local school or some other facility or company, there, there is interaction between those that are hiring you and what their policies are going to be for permitting people into the workplace. And this is stuff that's beyond just the operation of the image. It has to be thought out and policies have to be developed ahead of time. So the bottom line from all of this, and I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, finish on time here for everybody today, deeper screening is legal. It's legal and medical information must be kept confidential. One of the things I said early on was to turn off auto image recording. If you're recording imagery, that is medical information. If you were just using this as a screening tool live, there's nothing to be recorded. You don't have to worry about confidentiality. Your measurement only has the permanence of a person standing in front of the imager. But you don't want to go blabbing later on, oh, so-and-so tested positive this morning, came up with a fever, and they sent him home. That's not for you to share. That's confidential information. Now, if an uh, employee or coworker so-and-so lets others know that they had a fever and got turned away, that's up to them. But you, as a screener, need to stay mum on this. You need to hold your tongue and not share it with anybody else. And if you do, if you do or are requested to keep an infrared image for a file, you've got to keep it confidential. Prior to implementing a screening program, policies must be developed to ensure the training and qualification of screening personnel to advise the public of the presence and purpose of the screening program, to protect the privacy of those being screened, and as I mentioned a moment ago, archiving of infrared images is not recommended. Also address how, um, what the policy is going to be for denying access to federal persons and how long before they may return. Will a physician's note be required? Uh, it's not a system where we recommend that somebody who tests positive and is, um, found would be febrile or have a fever, they don't go out the exit door, get back in line and come back in for a second try. You don't get two bites of the apple on the same day. Uh, I've heard of companies doing, uh, offering this as a possibility and it's not a good idea. Also, your policy should cover the storage and security of recorded imagery and any related documents associated with the inspection program or screening program and provide for calibration and maintenance of all test equipment. So if you do elect to become involved in this application, some tips for screening operators would be that accurate data collection and interpretation is dependent largely upon the operator. Thermographers or operators equipment should be trained and qualifi qualified to operate their equipment. And having a mentor for new thermographers is recommended, but not required. To this end, Infrospection Institute developed this past spring a dedicated training course to this application. It is uh, roughly a five hour course and is available online. You can learn more about that course uh, on infrared body temperature screening at the Infrospection website, which is www.infrospection.com to learn more about the course. We're also available via email here uh, and uh, uh, by telephone for those who would like to speak about the application. And that's all I have for you this morning. Any questions? That's awesome, Jim. Thank you so much. I got to set my, I got to make sure my infrared camera is set to 0 0.98. <laughs> um, yeah. And we were talking about home inspection companies. There are a lot of multi inspection uh, inspector companies out there. Um, but the law is um, for 50, it applies to 15 uh, companies with 15 uh, or more employees, the ADA law. That is correct. However, just because you may not be covered, I would also caution against offering anything that should be kept confidential publicly. 
Yeah, for sure. It's just a, just a good practice. Yep. So I know you had called, I had emailed me early in the spring and I was reluctant to uh, respond with a cavalier or quick email. Yep. This is why, because I was embroiled in research for this. And I'm sitting yep. here at my desk. I have uh, a stack of documents, which is over four inches thick, and <laughs> it's enough to put insomniacs to sleep. But this is the information I had to, to weed through because yep. even though I'm a thermographer with almost 40 years experience, this is not something we had experienced. And we're dealing with laws and regulations internationally, domestically, some of them relaxed domestically here in the U.S. So there's no simple answer or, or, or one word answer. Anybody who's giving you one word answers or selling you, oh, it's, yeah, it's really easy. Anything's easy when you know what you're doing. But until you know what you don't know, then it's not, it's not good practice to offer cavalier answers. Okay. So if I, was, if I seemed reluctant to answer you earlier with a cavalier answer or a one word answer, you can see why. Yep. And that's what we expect from uh, your, um, your company, um, Infrospection Institute, you know, standards, thoughtful, slow thinking, not quick responses. Um, because you're, you're taking a lot of responsibility when you train and certify someone. And if I was an inspector, I'd go to an Infrospection Institute and get um, some training and certification. So I appreciate that offer for the online course. We do have a couple questions if you have some time. I have all the time. Go right uh, ahead. Philip Phyllis asked, I was at a store and the security guard was a screener. The screening was done near the door and the imager was pointed at the side of my face. What do you say to the screener and can the imager be read properly from the side of a person's face? That's a great question, Phyllis, and it really underscores one of the things I'm talking about. There's a lot of people out there with imaging systems and they're not, they haven't been trained. They're not following the proper protocol. What I would say to you, first of all, is, is, is a question. Do you want to go shopping today? And if the answer is yes, I would say that you probably just need to walk on by knowing that what they're doing is probably highly ineffective. It's not standards compliant. The reason the standards exist is not just for, for the purpose of developing regulations. It's to help ensure accuracy. And if I were to engage everyone that I came across on a daily basis as to how they're doing it improperly, I would waste a lot of my time. You'll waste a lot of yours. The purpose for this presentation is make you aware of what is in the standards. As I said, it's not my, not my uh, intent to pontificate or stand here with my hands on my hips and tell you this is how it has to be done. It's not my words. These are the words of experts who've been looking at this for many years, and I happen to agree with them because it, what they, these standards do employ the best practices. In fact, one of the things I tried to do when we, we sat down to uh, write this course is to possibly develop a new standard. Well, when I looked at the standards in place, there's just no reason to do it. They're already there. So just digest them, disseminate them, make them easy to understand. As to your local uh, merchant, I applaud their interest in thermal imaging, but I would say to you that I'd be very surprised if they catch many people because they're measuring the wrong spot and they're not asking them to stand still. That's another downside and I'm assuming the equipment is, is the right stuff uh, but walking right in from the outside um, there's no time for the person to acclimate I'd be very surprised if they have very many meaningful findings hmm. um, I, I, I suspect and this, this is, goes beyond the course but I suspect that if their screening program is effective in any way it's probably it's probably because people are less likely to leave their homes or places of business enter that store with a fever. Yep. I mean, just having a screening system in place has the, has the capability of changing us, changing our behaviors socially. You know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm a person who relies upon my job every day for a source of income and I need, the, I need to go to work to get paid, but I know I'm gonna get popped at the front door I'm more likely to stay home than try and go to work with perhaps what I feel is a low-grade fever. Hmm. So I think there's a social aspect to this that really just can't be measured. But you know, I, you know, if you're not feeling well, would you climb out of bed knowing that you're going to get turned away at the door and not get paid for the day? Probably not. Hmm. So, but uh, to your question, Phyllis, it's a good question. We're seeing a lot of it, and uh, it's just one of those things you could you could offer them, and I would appreciate it if you'd let them know that they can learn more about this and uh, become certified as a body temperature. A body temperature screener by visiting infrospection.com and taking our course. 
<laughs> uh, we have another uh, question um, from Corn. I apologize if I didn't pronounce it correctly, Corn. Um, this is a concern, Corn says, here in South Africa, at the very entrance of every store, you get screened with a handheld unit that will clearly give or make a difference from store to store. So um, that's in South Africa, store to store, handheld screening. Yeah, I think that uh, you'll find that across the board and in, uh, across the board globally, there's a lot more application of infrared. This was the case in Asia, in particular in China in 2003 with the SARS outbreak. And I must say that I, I think that outside the United States, others have been far more diligent than we have been here. And I, I, won't, I won't open that up for a discussion, but I think the numbers tell a story. Uh, I'm, my home state is New Jersey. We had very strict regulations uh, applied early on. Um, nobody liked them. Uh, they were tough, uh, but we are, we're in a better place than we were back in April, where we were second only to New York uh, yeah. with infections. Um, I think that thermal imaging across the board has um, wide application and it can make a difference, but it has to be used properly. And that's what's so important. Just setting it up with a store and just teaching any employee to use it or not pay attention to it, not following the right protocols is not going to be effective. You're going to miss a lot. Yep. And if they're catching a lot of people, getting a lot of false positives, they're going to say, oh, this isn't working. They're going to adjust the levels until they get what they think is reasonable. Right. So it's, uh, it, it's very, very important to be done properly. Uh, and if you're not committed to doing it properly, then it just really is a feel-good public relations type of thing for those who don't know any better. Um, someone asked for um, your website and email address and phone number. I think uh, I just put up your uh, website right here. It's infrospection.com, infrospection.com. If you want to contact Jim, ask more questions or get trained and certified. Jim, I really appreciate your time uh, spending with us uh, talking about this really important uh, service that's going on. And uh, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You were quite welcome, Ben. And thank you to everybody who attended today. To answer the one question you, didn't just an you did not answer just then, my yeah. email is very, very simple. Yep. It is jim, J-I-M, at infrospection.com. Awesome. Okay, Jim, stay safe and healthy. And uh, let's do this again sometime. We'll look forward to it, Ben. Thanks. Have a great day and a better tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye.